Well, hello Newcastle, or wherever the hell we are. Um, so I'm Ellen McAdam, I'm the director of Birmingham Museums Trust, and uh, I need to issue a health warning before I begin. The, the slides I'm showing are not in any way related to what I'm saying, they're just eye candy. So <laughs> please don't strain your brains by trying to make a connection. The first slide was Birmingham's medieval moated manor, which I'll be referring to later. So Birmingham is the biggest uh, museums, civic museum service in England. We have a huge collection of between 800,000 and a million objects. The reason the number varies is because it really depends on how you count the cases of butterflies. Are they one object or are they 150? Uh, we have uh, every conceivable sort of collection area, uh, art, decorative <coughs> art, natural history, world culture, science and technology, uh, the automotive industry, human history from all over the world, especially the former British Empire. And we're probably best known for our collection of pre-Raphaelite art, which is the, the finest uh, public collection of pre-Raphaelite art in the world, if you like that sort of thing. And of course, Burne Jones was from Birmingham. If you're moderately athletic, you can hit where the place where he was born with a stone from Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery. And we have a very large archaeology collection. Of course, we have the Staffordshire Hoard, but we also have a big regional collection uh, of everything from the Paleolithic onwards. We have the European archaeology, we have Cypriot uh, archaeology, a lot of Mesopotamian material, Ur, Nimrud, Nineveh. We have material from Jericho. Uh, from Tel El Amarna and a big Mesoamerican ceramics collection. But most mysteriously, apart from the Staffordshire Hoard, which has its own gallery, there's very little on display uh, recently, or at least recently in museum terms, about six years ago, we redisplayed uh, a set of galleries to show Birmingham history. And they start with the Paleolithic hand axe and then move seamlessly towards Birmingham's medieval moated manor, uh, which is still there in Birmingham. It lies under the current site of the wholesale markets in what is the only part of the city which still retains anything like any sort of sense of identity or personality whatsoever. So naturally, the planners of Birmingham City Council have drafted proposals to trash the whole area and build uh, flats and Starbucks outlets all over it. However, we do have a collection that reflects the Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Saxon, uh, Roman and Saxon presence in the region, which we studiously ignore. Uh, we have a few objects on display from Wheelie Castle, which is a medieval moated manor site. It's one of Birmingham Museum's nine sites, and it, it, it was, uh, it's in the middle of one of Birmingham's first interwar housing estates, one of the first pieces of slum clearance. And it's both deeply loved by the surrounding population and regularly vandalised by them. <coughs> <laughs> Don't ask me to explain it. Um, and apart from the hoard, which is the focus of a big Historic England-sponsored research project, th this astonishing collection is very little used for teaching and research by academics. Uh, the University of Birmingham still has a Department of Archaeology, despite the best efforts of the university hierarchy. And I'm actively engaged with Professor Henry Chapman in devising projects that will make parts of the collection more visible as resources for teaching and research, as well as for conservation management. Uh, we have, for example, a very interesting collection of topographical views of the city which show what it was like before the planners finished off what the Luftwaffe had begun. And uh, we propose to digitise them and make them accessible to the planners, who will no doubt ignore them. And Mike Hodder, the former city archaeologist, who must be one of the least retired people I've ever met, uh, <laughs> works tirelessly on our unpublished sites. But otherwise, to a great extent, this amazing collection is invisible. And why is this, I asked myself. Uh, because it wasn't always this way. In the late 
19th century, Birmingham museums worked very closely with the Birmingham and Warwickshire Archaeological Society, uh, particularly on the project to document the surviving medieval buildings of the city and the surrounding region. So the we jointly commissioned quite a well-known artist to do watercolours of surviving buildings and also in a rather daring embrace of modern technology, uh, we simultaneously photographed them. And the photographs are still in the Birmingham li Library and we have the watercolours. And together they make up an extraordinary record of the changing face of the city and the surrounding region, which remain very rural right up until really the immediate post-First World War period. In fact, I was interested recently, I was trundling into town on the number 14 bus uh, and I noticed uh, along its route in East Birmingham, which is an area of almost exclusively South Asian population these days, uh, what had been a, a former 18th century or possibly earlier coaching inn, which turns up in one of the topographical views, and is now a car repair shop. So it's one of my dearest ambitions to get that uh, watercolour photographed and go and present it to Mr Patel of the car repair shop and show him how historic his workshop is. And we were uh, also active in field work in the region and we were active in sponsoring excavations abroad, particularly in the Near East. Uh, and this was done in particular by the newspaper proprietors of Birmingham. So we had a particularly close relationship with Sir Leonard Woolley, who excavated Ur, and he gave us uh, paintings and objects. He collected quite a respectable collection of uh, mainly <coughs> Renaissance paintings from the money he got from the lecture tours of America. And in as far as Ur is concerned, he gave us objects he almost certainly shouldn't have had because there was a very strict antiquities law in Iraq, even while he was digging. Uh, but I'm prepared not to tell the Iraqi government if you don't. And he gave us the watercolours which were used to, to illustrate the two excavation report volumes of the royal tombs of Ur. At the time, uh, colour photography wasn't reliable enough to to really reproduce the gold and lapis lazuli and carnelian and other exotic materials that were found in the royal tombs. And so they hired a very, a very, very good American illustrator. And um, there's a letter in the file from the British Museum saying, we didn't know you had those, why did he give them to you? And one can fairly hear the gnashing of their teeth, which is deeply satisfying because it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not often a regional museum puts one over in the British Museum. <laughs> and B Birmingham Museum seems to have remained active into, in local archaeology into the 1980s, but I haven't found much evidence of activity after this, until the Horde, that is, which was a local sensation. Um, it sparked phenomenal local interest. People literally queued around the block to see it when it was first found. And they contributed handsomely to the appeal to acquire it. And they continue to turn up in large numbers to see it today, both in Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery and in the Potteries Museum in Stoke and Trent. And this is why I find it so curious that archaeology is such a neglected area in so many major regional museums. Birmingham has what is called a super diverse population. 46% of the population is now BAME, and it's <coughs> reckoned that by the time of the next census it will be 50 50. It's a very young population as well, and it's, that's why the, the proportion is growing so quickly. And as one of my, our community partners said to me recently in a very caring, supportive way, he said, your traditional elderly white ABC1 audiences will soon be dead. <laughs> and my Bangladeshi audiences are not interested in the pre-Raphaelites. What will you do then? I think he's wrong, incidentally. All we have to do with the pre-Raphaelites is change the focus from the willowy ladies they depict to focus on their personal lives, which range from serial adultery to wombat keeping. And everybody will be interested in the pre-Raphaelites. <laughs> but it is an interesting fact 
that when we survey our audiences, the pre-Raphaelites come very low down the list of what local people are interested in. And it was the same in Glasgow when we surveyed our audiences. Charles Rennie Mackintosh came about 46th out of 100 collection areas. People had get enough of a, a single subject. And the most popular subject in both cities was local history and archaeology. The public don't really distinguish between local history and archaeology. As far as they're concerned, it's just the past of the place where they live now. And this interest transcends ethnicity <coughs> or gender or age or class. And interestingly, the second most popular subject area is usually local natural history. So people are just interested in the places where they live. So why don't we have more local archaeology in our museum? And why are we not still active in archaeology? Well, it's partly because, like all British regional museums, we're now in dire financial straits because of the pro progressive reduction in funding for local authorities. Museums are not a statutory service, so they're obviously going to be the first thing to be cut. Uh, and we're down to our last four curators for a collection of nearly a million objects, which is pretty serious. But until recently, we did have an archaeology curator. So I, I don't really know how to explain why uh, local history and archaeology has slipped so far down the totem pole. And it's partly because in, in all uh, local authority museums, the, the curatorial hierarchy is heavily dominated by flat art. And it's partly because flat art is of high monetary value, but it's also partly a class thing, to be honest. And it's partly also, I think, because curatorship has lost its way in a lot of regional museums and needs to be reinvented. Uh, curators have forgotten, I think, in many museums what they're there for, which is to document the collection and make it accessible to the public. It's not just a fanny around answering public inquiries and pottering around the store occasionally. <laughs> But I also think that part of the problem is a disconnect between museums and archaeology as a profession. During my working lifetime, archaeology has become uh, increasingly professionalised. In fact, I was, I was deeply gloomed to remember last night that this is the 25th anniversary of the first time I ever addressed an IFA conference, so some of you won't have been born then. Um, Archaeology has become professionalised, and in a strange way, curatorship in museums has gone, if anything, backwards. The CIFA is now a professional body, but the Museums Association is just a pressure group. And other bodies are expanding to fill the gap that the Museums Association has left, so the National Museum Directors Council is increasingly important and consulted by government. And it, again, is dominated by the big London nationals and by people with an art historical background. Uh, God bless the Society of Museum Archaeologists. Why doesn't it merge with the CIFA? Uh, how many museum directors are members of either? How many museum directors even know that the SME exists? So mu regional museums are in deep financial trouble anyway, and without a strong professional body, it's not perhaps surprising that they struggle to communicate effectively with archaeology, which has become so strongly a profession. And yet, museums could do so much for archaeology. What museums, the, particularly the regional museums, are really good at is using real objects to communicate with and engage audiences. We see 120,000 school children a year. We have over a million visitors. When you think that the vast majority of these visitors are all strongly interested in local history and archaeology, there is a ready-made publicity machine waiting for professional archaeology. It would raise the publicity, they would raise the profile of archaeology with elected members. It paints a picture of archaeology <coughs> as something that the electorate want, not as an irritating byproduct of the development process. We're still a democracy, at least until the 8th of June, and public opinion still matters. And the alternative is the status quo in which museums are simply not engaging with field work in any meaningful sense but we're still expected to accept and store the results in perpetuity. And I do think that what we've ended up with is a very weird business model in which archaeologists create an archive on behalf of a client 
who isn't interested in it. It is an unwanted byproduct of the development process, and they give it to museums who can't afford to make it accessible to the one section of the po- public of the population who are genuinely interested in it. And the whole process is ignored by academics who never come near the stuff. In the three and a half years I've been in Birmingham museums, I think we've had one visit from the University of Birmingham to use the collection for teaching purposes. So there are lots of different things we could do from what we're doing at the moment. We could give every primary school a do-it-to-yourself British archaeology kit. We could take a leaf from Mortimer Wheeler's book and sell certified Roman pottery shards to tourists. <laughs> we could open up excavations to school groups and volunteers. We could talk to each other. We could get drunk. No, I didn't write that. Um, <laughs> We could engage the public in determining which archives are worth keeping in perpetuity and which ones we should skip. But for Christ's sake, let's just not keep on doing what we are doing. Thank you very much.